you know, from people without arms and legs who are doing amazing things, those big physical problems, challenges, to people who have psychological challenges. They're, they have fear and anxiety and huge self-doubt. And, um, you know, kids in the foster care system who just have this lousy, you know, they're abandoned by their parents. And what does that do to your whole psyche? You know, I had great parents. I was lucky. Uh, so yeah, uh, you realize, I realized over time working with this community that challenges, uh, a lot of the profound ones are invisible. They're not like blindness or being a, in a wheelchair. They're, they're, they're hidden. And uh, those are just as profound or maybe, maybe harder. You know, like people who come back from war with psychological trauma, you know, PTSD. You know, there's a prosthetic for the legs that enable you her to climb. But so far, there's not a prosthetic for the brain. Mm. And so, um, so, so, yeah, it's, I, and that was another big point of writing No Barriers. The book was, you know, just this idea of leaning in to say, like, look, we're all in this great No Barriers boat. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have a ton in common. And if we lean in, we can break through so many of the barriers in the world uh, rather than sort of isolating ourselves and focusing on our differences. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. And welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm your host, Dan Moyle, and I'm so glad that you're joining me today. Now, I typically record this intro after the interview, and I did that with, with this, today's guest. And I am coming off of a, of a high of a conversation that was just incredible. Uh, in this episode, we're, I talk with an American athlete, uh, an adventurer, an author, an activist, a motivational speaker, uh, and he happens to be the first blind person to reach the summit of Mount Everest uh, back on May 25th of 2001. He's also one of only about 150 people in the world, in the entire world, to summit the highest point of each of the seven continents. Uh, that's Eric Weinmayer, and today he shares the, with the Storytellers Network his storytelling craft. He shares a few stories, uh, some of his successes and stumbles and those around him. In other words, Eric shares his story, and it is incredibly powerful. Uh, now, before we get into that conversation, just a reminder to find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for all kinds of information there. And if you like what we're doing, please consider leaving us a review so we can help uh, reach new storytellers. And thank you to Podcast Pilot and Casterly for supporting this movement. If you want experts on the podcast world, like how to start your very own show, talk to the teams headed up over there by the amazing Jamie J and Sarah Parrish. Now, let's get to the stories. So thanks for joining me on the show today, Eric. I do appreciate your time, man. Awesome. Uh, so I like to kind of find out where everybody is in the world because to me being a storyteller you can do it from you know anywhere in the world really so where are you uh based out of i'm in a town called golden <clears throat> it's in colorado it's near denver but it's a beautiful little valley and it's surrounded by foothills in the rockies and there's incredible mountain biking mm. i have a tandem bike mountain bike full suspension um there's great ice climbing not so far away. There's great skiing. We have a creek that runs through our town that um, has great kayaking in the spring and summer. Mm. And uh, right, like I can walk uh, in my backyard up to these really fun cliffs for great rock climbing. So it's a paradise for outdoorsy people. Nice. It sounds like it. Um, now, so you, you talked about climbing and biking, all this other stuff. And, and in the intro, I mentioned your, your, your few books that you've written, including No Barriers and Touch the Top of the World. Um, so obviously, you are a writer. Uh, yeah. do, you, have you, do you consider yourself a storyteller too, in general? Yeah, I like telling stories. I think it's a really powerful way to convey ideas and messages 
to people. I think our brains, you know, through thousands and thousands of years have sort of been programmed to, you know, capture the essence of an idea through a story. So yeah, I, when I speak to groups, uh, you know, I'm not like the kind of speaker that's like, you know, here are 10 lessons for success. You know, I just think that that just gets so old. Basically I'm telling stories and uh, smart audiences, they, they, they get how you weave those stories together. So like a tapestry, like a, you know, threads through a tapestry mm. and, uh, and, and then you reach the end and they get that, you know, this, this is a theme, um, you know, the way these threads weave together that uh, applies to them. Yeah. Now, congratulations, by the way, on the re- recently released in paperback version of No Barriers. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. They just released a couple weeks ago. It looks right. really nice. Well, it feels really nice, I should say. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, cool. And everybody's telling you that it looks nice, so that's good, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. you've been so you've been writing your own stories since uh, age, it was about 13 when blindness began to creep in for you, right? Yeah, I was born legally <laughs> blind, so meaning I could see just a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. I could see enough to ride a bike and run around through the woods, bouncing off of trees and not seeing very well, but kind of surviving. And then middle school is when my sight started getting worse and worse. Like I couldn't see the board in the classroom anymore. I couldn't see the regular print and books. And, Mm. um, and it was right before my freshman year in high school that I went totally blind. Like I couldn't see to take a step. And, Mm. uh, you know, that was, that was scary, you know, like, uh, I don't even know. It's a hard thing to even describe. But obviously you've refused to let it sideline you. Um, and, and which includes being a writer. So where does your story as a storyteller begin though? Do you know when you started to kind of really realize you had that gift of storytelling? Well, first of all, you know, to respond to, you know, yeah, I've, I've wound up on my feet and I've, I live a really extraordinary life and I'm very, very fortunate, but that's a, that's a process, right? Mm. It's a long, long process to get, uh, to kind of, you know, start to, I don't know, get, get more awakened, uh, with your mind and with your heart and so forth. I mean, there's, there's a, there, it's a long process and I, I'm still not figuring it out fully, but (laughs) it's not like, you know, a blind person, you know, goes blind or something tragic happens to you and, you know, you say, what an opportunity for growth. And then you just charge forward. Um, human beings, you lay on your belly and you pound your fists and you rail against how unfair life is in the universe. And, um, and, and then eventually you start, you get up and you start moving forward and you start building tools and the mindset that's going to take you out of there, out of that dark place. And um, so I think that really is related to my sense of telling my story because I started thinking about what that map looks like. You know, what does that map look like between those dark places and those summits, whatever they look like. And nobody's really told that story. That's sort of in a way like sort of unexplored terrain. And I really wanted to understand what growth, what change, really look like in a real person, like not Hollywood, not fictional books, but real people. So I became an observer of one, my own process, and two, other human beings that have just been crushed or have been stuck, and then they figure out ways to move forward. And that to me was just, I was so intensely interested in what that journey looked like. And do you think, so do you think that that summit to Valley to Summit world is what you love about telling stories for sure i i am so fascinated by people like for instance i went climbing uh, almost 20 years ago now and it became one of the you know basis points to no barriers the book Uh, i climbed with mark wellman who is a paraplegic Uh, he had gotten hurt in the mountains and he was paralyzed from the waist down and a guy named hugh her who's a double egg amputee uh, he lost his legs also in a climbing accident, and um, eventually, w- going through his journey, he t- was a tinkerer, and he went into his garage and built these legs that enabled him to climb again at a really high level, <laughs> um, wedging his little prosthetic f- 
feet into these seams in the rock that no human foot could even stand up in and became an amazing climber, one of the country's best climbers. And the three of us climbed this beautiful rock face together, a project that Mark was putting together. I carried Mark down the trail. Uh, Hugh did the hard leading. Um, Mark has this pull-up system where he's like basically doing pull-ups up the rope. And yeah, I mean, when I listen to these two guys climb, I just, it, it was so apparent to me that there were so many questions in this process of, you know, like, how do you pioneer all these new systems and ideas? How do you get your mind right? You know, how do you, um, how do you let go of your ego and come together as a team to do something really incredible? Um, and then, you know, even more like sort of esoteric things, like what is that thing inside people that, and you know, that, that, that flame, that light, that, that people kind of tap into, you know, for others, it kind of goes out and it, and it, it flickers and dies and others, it, they, they tap into it and they, it blazes into the world. I, I was so fascinated by those guys. And, uh, and as I said, that, that journey that they took and, and, and it was a grittier journey than you would ever hear about. And I'm fascinated by the grittiness of it, you know, because um, Mark, for instance, you know, when he does his pull-ups up the rock face, you know, rocks and dirt are like coming off the face and landing in his face and in his eyes and in his mouth. And, um, you know, paraplegics have a, have a catheter sometimes where, you know, because they, they can't control when they pee and uh, his catheter and his pee bag, Burt, like kind of rubbed against the rock and burst and so yeah. the guy smelled like pee like the whole day and he just kept cranking forward and I was like so like this story smells like pee and <laughs> tastes like blood a lot more than people want to admit and 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 I didn't want to shy away from that like I you know part of the map that people build requires a lot of flailing and bleeding and suffering and I, I was really fascinated by that because that really connected with my life I when I went blind, I, I really, and, and I, my mom died when I was uh, a teenager in a car accident. I, I really went through a lot of pain and I was fascinated by how that pain in your life gets converted into something bigger too. Yeah, that, man, that's an incredible uh, set of circumstances that you face and then that you've surrounded yourself with people who face those kinds of uh, obstacles and, and I love what you how you define someone and you do this for yourself but you, you mentioned it too with your buddy is that you don't define people by their let's say disability right you're not a blind adventurer you are uh, an elite adventurer an athlete oh and by the way you can't see and I, and I love that about how you, how you tell those stories yeah and the same goes for um, one of the people I wrote about in the book uh, her name's Mandy Harvey she is a, a, mu a musician, um, but when she was in uh, uh, college, she was studying music in college at CSU, Colorado uh -huh. State University, and she went deaf. Uh, very inopportune time to go <laughs> deaf in your life during your music program that you're <laughs> learning to be a, 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 a music therapist. Mm -hmm. And she thought singing was over for her, like totally done. And she just went into this huge funk and her dad, um, he was a minister and he, they would sing together growing up. Uh, and he just said, Hey, let's like connect again. Like let's sing together. And I'll, and, and, um, even though you can't hear, it'll be like, sort of like just reconnecting with something we used to do and enjoy. So they started singing together. And over time she realized that she had perfect pitch that, you know, music that hearing it was in her, in her brain. It wasn't in her ears. And for me, seeing isn't in my eyes, it's in my brain, it, mm. you know, so these things are inside your brain. Um, and, you know, of course, now her hearing didn't work. So she had to find new ways of getting that talent out past her senses that didn't work anymore. But hmm. um, she sings but with like, a, you know, on a stage barefoot so that she feels the vibration of the instruments under her feet. She has all these visual cues with her her musicians and she learns a new song by singing it like the way she hears it in her mind. And then she uses an iPhone. That's like a, uh, a like a pitch, like an audio thing that tells her whether she's on key or not. Oh, wow. Uh, and that's how she learned. So these new array of technologies and these new systems and she's singing in a, you know, professionally 
touring all around the world. She just uh, was in the finals of America's Got Talent. And yeah, she describes herself as a musician uh, and a songwriter uh, who is deaf not a deaf songwriter. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh because the disability comes second. My uh my family and I actually watched that America's Got Talent and, and incredible. She was uh, our favorite and 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 I I'm a I'm a, a big fan of American sign language. I I happen to take some in college, but I I love watching that communication. It's such a beautiful language. It's really it's, beautiful and she she does sign language as she's singing, yeah. which makes it this really special show. Yeah. Because you're, you know, you're, you're now hearing this amazing person with this amazing voice with an amazing story. <laughs> and then also this very cool sort of artistic signing that she's doing as she's singing. Yeah. Now, so Eric, w- whether it's your writing, whether it's storytelling like this, whether it's on a stage, what is it that is so rewarding to you about storytelling? Well, I was a teacher for six years and I always sort of enjoyed writing. Um, and so I got kind of pushed into writing my first book. Like a lot of good people in my life said, Hey, you should start, you should think about writing a book. And I, and I wrote that first book, touch the top of the world about climbing mountains around the world. And I realized that, you know, um, and by the way, I just got thrown in front of a group, uh, uh, (laughs) That climb uh, of this climb of uh, Denali uh, McKinley, the tallest peak in Alaska in North America, it was sponsored by um, the American Foundation for the Blind, and and they had a financial sponsor. So anyway, they threw me in front of this group, and I was terrified. And I <laughs> and I was I locked myself in my room for the weekend, and it was like, what am I going to do? I was like pulling my hair out, and I got in front of that group, and I sort of realized that you know, good speaking is like good writing. You know what I mean? It's just creating images and very simple messages and a flow. And you, uh, you know, and and people walk away with sort of some new thoughts and, and, and some, you know, I hate the word inspiration, but kind of an inspiration to make big changes and growth in their own life. And so it was really, I found it a really powerful platform to help people uh, change and grow. Uh, mm. and so, uh, it sort of created a trajectory for me and I just kept sort of trying to perfect my ability to tell stories in front of groups. And, um, I don't know, I've been doing it now for 20 years. Yeah. Now, so I, I hear you say, uh, grow and change, helping others change and grow and, and inspire. Is that how you see our, kind of our job as storytellers is to, to help people and be that change agent almost. Yeah, I do think that. And, you know, and again, my style, like you heard talk me talk about that story with Mark and Hugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not really to beat people over the head with like, you know, these lessons or anything like that. Although I, you know, I, I do think good storytelling shares a map, a kind of a map that people can, 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 can use the waypoints of that story to navigate their own lives. But Mm -hmm. I don't think it's like, you know, where you just like tell them the thing, you know, here are the 10 steps, Mm -hmm. because I think that's honestly kind of BS, Um, you know, because everyone's journey is different and everyone's journey is sort of, I don't know, spiritual and, and, and really important. And it almost undermines that person's journey by, you know, by, by laying out my idea of, of, of exactly, you know, the steps that you need to take in your life. I I think it dishonors people. Hmm. So what I try to do is to tell the stories that sort of show that, you know, the things I've learned and bled um, with the macro understanding of what that map looks like through real people. And then people walk away with the waypoints that they need uh, to, to their own lives a good lesson to take away from that for sure. Um, so that's what you love about storytelling, Eric, what is a challenge with storytelling that you face? Um, the challenge sometimes like for me is like, you know, you tell all these amazing stories and you really are sort of weaving this, this map as I, as I mentioned, and then, you know, like you get to the end and somebody comes up to me and they, they say, uh, you know, like, um, 
you know, my brother would have loved that talk. He, he, he's blind. <laughs> or <laughs> my husband would have loved that talk. He's a climber. And I'm like, oh, darn, you know, I worked so hard, but I must have failed a little bit because, you know, you're thinking that this story is about climbing mountains or about being blind. And it's, it's not. It's about like how we all lean in as human beings and share sort of certain things um, that we use together to, 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 to navigate. And um, it, it's, it's about all of us. It's about it's not just about people who can't see or can't walk. It's about all of us because all of us have challenges. All of us have barriers that hold us back. So um, I think that's the challenge is that, um, you know, it's so hard to communicate the, the universal piece of what you're trying to do. And do you, so you mentioned everybody has obstacles. Do you see that what some might call a disability in you uh, has shaped your storytelling craft? Or do you think that because everybody kind of faces obstacles, it, it doesn't necessarily make it unique? That's a really bad way to ask that question. You know, but. It's a good question. No, it's a great question. I think I mean, it's unique and it's not because, <clears throat> I mean, the people, you know, of course, going blind is a big challenge. Um, but, you know, when I started this organization, No Barriers, and this movement, building it, and now we work with thousands and thousands of people each year, you realize that everyone has a story. And just because somebody isn't blind, they still have challenges, really significant, major challenges that are impossible to compare. You know, like whose challenge is harder or bigger? You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it, that does dishonor as well. And so, you know, from people without arms and legs who are doing amazing things, those big physical problems, challenges, to people who have psychological challenges. They're, they have fear and anxiety and huge self-doubt. And, um, you know, kids in the foster care system who just have this lousy, you know, they're abandoned by their parents. And what does that do to your whole psyche? You know, I had great parents. I was lucky. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you realize, I realized over time working with this community that challenges uh, a lot of the profound ones are invisible. They're not like blindness or being a, in a wheelchair. They're, they're, they're hidden. And uh, those are just as profound or maybe, maybe harder. You know, like people who come back from war with psychological trauma, you know, PTSD. You know, there's a prosthetic for the legs that enable Hugh her to climb. But so far, there's not a prosthetic for the brain. Mm. And so, um, so, so yeah, it's, I, and that was another big point of writing No Barriers, the book was, you know, just this idea of leaning in to say like, look, we're all in this great No Barriers boat <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have a ton in common. And if we lean in, we can break through so many of the barriers in the world uh, rather than sort of isolating ourselves and focusing on our differences. And, and you mentioned PTSD, you mentioned coming back from like from war, or other, other uh, terrible things going on. Obviously, No Barriers is this organization that you started, but you also started the No Barriers Warriors uh, part of that uh, with your yeah. friend. Now, is that where you've learned some of that too? I mean, what, what drove you to help those other warriors that go above and beyond even what anybody else does? Well, it's a program that we integrated into no barriers in the overall umbrella organization, but it's, yeah, it's one of our programs. Now we work with veterans. We work with several hundred vets a year and we take them on these expeditions. We call them transformative expeditions because we're not just climbing mountains together, rafting rivers. Um, it's really more of a journey and it. And, and as we go along that journey, you know, we have the soldiers stop and reflect, take a pause kind of think about their no barriers life, the waypoints of their life. We call them our no barriers elements. You know, what are these elements? What are these universal pieces on that journey that we have to really focus on to equip ourselves to grow and change? And so we focus on that process. We go through an experience together. Uh, the first one we did was a, a, a climb in Nepal with a team of 10 injured veterans from blindness to uh, amputees to PTSD to brain trauma. Um, and we climbed a 20,000 foot peak called Lobuche. 
And the vets said, you know, that experience was more therapeutic than five years of therapy. Hmm. And um, we realized we were onto something here that these, these journeys, if you, you can kind of use them to reprogram your mind and your, and your soul um, after you get broken, you know, you kind of come back and do a similar journey, believe it or not, because a climbing journey or a rafting river journey, it also involves some adversity and some risk and some challenge. Um, but when you're supported by this amazing team and you're kind of now like better equipped, you actually reprogram yourself in a, in a, in a new way. Um, science calls it neuroplasticity, this idea of reprogramming the brain to, uh, to kind of have a new mindset on life now. And, uh, so we've been doing that. Um, our first expedition was in 2010. So we've been doing it for seven, eight years now. What a, what a great way to give back to. And then uh, obviously as a storyteller to hear more stories and be able to share those as inspiration. So that, that's a, that's very cool, Eric. I like that. Yeah. What? And the stories of the vets, I mean, have been so powerful to me. They're very concrete. Some of them, you know, like uh, this guy I was just emailing this morning, this guy, Pedro <clears throat> um, came back from, Iraq, he was really emotionally devastated, suicidal, um, went through our program. He still struggles a lot, you know, and when he came home from our program, we always have people take a, a no barriers pledge. It's like, what are they going to do with this experience now? What are they going to use it for? And he wanted to help people, but he didn't know how, you know, because you, you're kind of derailed, you're kind of sidetracked, and you don't know whether you can get back on the wagon or not and lead and serve again, you know, he was just sort of still searching. And um, when the Houston hurricane happened, um, he decided that this was what, you know, he couldn't, he just was watching it on the news and couldn't stand it. And so he, he, he was compelled and he started an organization, um, to distribute food packets. Uh, and he distributed like 10,000 food packets personally to the victims of Houston. And he was so inspired by the fact that he was making an impact that he went to Puerto Rico after that and distributed like another 20 or 30,000 food packets. Wow. Uh, and you know, he, he'll always be kind of, he'll always have darkness in his life. You know what I mean? It's not like he's going to completely quote unquote transform and be a different person, but yet he realized though that part of his healing was to find purpose in his life and he found purpose. Uh, and that, and that's, that's powerful. So, uh, you know, the, they're very simple stories with a lot of complexity underneath. Mm. And, and you're great at telling those complex stories. And obviously you hear a ton of them. Do you have a favorite story, whether it's from this world or something maybe from growing up? Yeah. My favorite story is um, when I was going blind, um, I couldn't see very well. I could see just like I'd lost total sight in my left eye and I could see just a little bit out of my right eye and, and uh, I couldn't do the things I love to do anymore. I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't be play baseball. Um, and I'd sit at my window and I would listen to the kids out in the cul-de-sac playing basketball and just being so sort of angry and frustrated. And anyway, but one thing I could do is watch TV. I'd get my face and press it against the TV. Uh, and and one night there was a show back in the eighties, they called it that's incredible. And they were focusing on this guy named Terry Fox. Uh, Terry was a Canadian and he had lost a leg to cancer. Uh, and it wasn't soon after he was released from the hospital that he decided that he was going to run, run across Canada, like, you know, thousands of miles, a marathon a day. Hmm. And I was blown away by that because you know, when you get that diagnosis and you lose your leg, okay, what do you do? You protect yourself, you shrink into a ball and you say like, I'm just going to protect, protect, protect. And you know, somehow that message didn't get to Terry because he got bigger. You know, he decides, okay, my response is I'm going to run across Canada. It's like this, um, this idea that there's a space between the things that happen to you and the ways that you're supposed to react. And in that space is the choice to do something completely different. And he did, he ran across Canada. He inspired a nation. He raised 
um, millions of dollars for cancer research. Uh, he's a national folk hero of Canada. Um, and here's the crazy part, the sad part. He died before he was able to finish the run, but it didn't matter. I mean, it mattered to him and his life, of course, but it didn't matter for his legacy because uh, um, people were so inspired that uh, there are Terry Fox runs all over the world now. And, uh, and, and the funny just kept, the, kept going. And now it's up to, I think, close to a billion dollars that his name has raised for cancer research. Wow. Uh, and so this is like a, this was so powerful to me because it said, you know, Hey, you can live bigger than you die. Um, you can take hard things and you can convert them, uh, into a kind of energy, a kind of darkness into vision. And that can give you the fuel to power yourself forward, uh, and sort of light your way. And Terry was, uh, you know, I wish I'd gotten to meet him. I love the idea of inspiring others and, and how, you know, you, you saw that through TV. Um, I want to talk a little bit about media in general and storytelling, whether it's TV, you seeing that story on TV, whether it's using social media today to tell stories. How do you think media in general affects storytelling? Well, I think everything's like turned into a soundbite. You know, maybe that's the challenge of media these days, you know? I think, uh, you know, media sort of, when you say the media, first of all, it's like, you're really saying us, you're mm -hmm. saying human beings, like our, our, our society, it's what we're asking for. It's our media is just trying to predict what, what appeals to people. So they're trying to do this guessing game of like, you know, what, what's exciting, what's interesting to, to, to people in the community. Um, so I think it's sort of our job as a society to start craving like deeper more in-depth kind of stories you know that have more complexity to them um you know not just sound bites i think if we you know really showed that there's a value for longer more comprehensive stories deeper stories then i think uh there'd be a market for that and i think there is beginning to be a market for that with these great podcasts like the one you're doing here um like, you know, these like really cool storytelling podcasts like This American Life and mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So I think there is beginning to be um, a, a, maybe a minority of the community that really craves these deep, rich stories that uh, really leave you kind of spinning for the rest of the day. And on, on that kind of same track, I think, is uh, the question that to hopefully help others kind of get their stories out today, whether it's through social media, whether it's big media, uh, whether it's podcasts, how are storytellers nowadays supposed to kind of get our stories out there in this kind of noisy uh, landscape? Uh, it's, it's really hard. I mean, um, yeah, because it is super noisy. Um, I, I mean, that's, I don't know if I have a solution for that because I mean, like we tell these no barrier stories and we have, we have a following, you know, we have a good following. Uh, people who are really fascinated by these wonderful transformational stories. But yeah, I think the, like the, the mainstream of media is still just like, you know, all that noise, like all the Trump news, you know, all the Twitter feeds. It's just, it's so distracting. It's like a, you know, focusing on the bomb going off instead of on, you know, the things that will really truly transform people. But it's hard, you know, when there's a bomb going off, not to focus on that, you know, that's just so distracting. Uh, so I just think it's kind of up to us to say, you know, like, look, I mean, of course, I'm going to be interested in the latest Trump tweet, but, um, you know, I have to save space um, for the kind of media storytelling that can really um, make that light that I have inside of me stronger, to, to, to burn stronger. And that's a different kind of story than the, than the bomb blast of, of the news. And when you were doing your, your book tours or trying, or still trying to get the word about uh, out about no barriers as the organization, is there any particular advice you'd give to somebody on that networking and that uh, storytelling that you could say, look, here's, I, I know you don't have like one answer on how to get our stories out today, yeah. but but if you had kind of one little piece of advice or one encouragement, maybe 
for anybody listening, what would you say to them? Yeah, I don't think there's like a perfect answer. It's really tricky these days. I mean, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, you just, it's, there's probably nothing I could say that's like that much of a secret. You know, you, you try to build your social media, you try to build your, your, uh, but Facebook, I mean, is like a whole challenge in itself, you know, mm-hmm. the way it's sort of become business. So business, uh, businessized. <laughs> that's not a word, but I just made it up. I like it. Uh, we'll coin it. Uh, that sounds good to me. <laughs> and, um, Anyway, uh, but yeah, build your social media, your community, um, and and um, and and if you're providing value, then yeah, you build that community, and and um, and you find channels to get your message out there. And the podcast world is a wonderful way to do that. You know, there's all these great new podcasts coming out. Um, so so yeah, I think there are ways to do it if if people are smart, but they have to understand. You know, like uh, it's it's a business. And you have to be, you know, smart when you're growing a business. So you have to like really kind of use the resources that you have in front of you. So at, at some point you've kind of, in my mind, you've made it, you know, whether it's being on Oprah, whether it's being, you know, on, on uh, bigger shows, being on the national stage, uh, three published books, this organization to me, you know, Eric Weinmayer is a guy who's made it. Do you kind of pinch yourself and think, yeah, I kind of have. Um, I, I do. I feel super fortunate. Um, you know, when we started growing No Barriers, we were a bunch of dirtbag volunteers. <laughs> um, and we were so overwhelmed. We thought like, well, man, we're going to go out of business tomorrow. Like, how are we going to sustain this thing? And fits and starts and, you know, near disasters and um, just sort of surviving. And then sort of slowly beginning to understand the equation of how to grow this thing, how to connect. Again, it was like my own no barriers process of how to build a great smart team around me. People were way smarter than me. When I look at our no barriers board now, I mean, it's like people who really know how to grow endeavors. Like they're, they're guys who are entrepreneurs and women who are entrepreneurs and uh, have grown projects and endeavors and and businesses um, and, and uh, experts in the, and, and, uh, you know, military stuff, uh, and, uh, and business leaders. And, and, uh, so, you know, and I realized part of that process was if I was going to grow this thing, I, I couldn't keep it wrapped around my finger that I had to let go. So there's sort of this, uh, connection between growth and letting go and not being able to control every little piece of it. So now we have a board of 30 on one person, and my voice isn't any louder than any of those other 29 people. Uh, and then a staff of 35 and 50 something part-time guides. So yeah, you, you know, that's the, that's the cost of growing things that you, you know, kind of have to let your ego, you know, and ego is not a bad thing always. I mean, it's, it's what drives things forward in really good ways sometimes, but, but also sometimes it can, it can sort of, sabotage you so anyway i had to make sure my ego uh, i let it i let it go in certain ways and and said you know the the key to growing this thing is 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 to get people involved who are a lot smarter and uh incredibly accomplished great advice um and is it has there been a point where like one thing has happened where you thought okay this is this is now proof that i've made it um well, the fact that I, I pinch myself that No Bears is doing pretty well. We have great sponsorships now, and mm-hmm. we're planning a, a summit in New York City for October 4th and 5th. We'll probably have three to 5,000 people in attendance. So, yeah, I do pinch myself when I think about the success that No Barriers has had and the lives that we're impacting. You know, I get emails and letters and texts from participants every day that I'm really good friends with now. And their lives are different because of their experience and no barriers. So yeah, I guess that becomes kind of a fuel too, that uh, kind of makes your day and helps you, you know, just keep growing. Uh, I, I can't imagine the number of lives that have been changed in those, those texts have got to feel good. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that's kind of a payoff for you. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I get texts from people who are just doing big things, you know, uh, you know, like uh, this morning, I got a text from uh, one of our participants. He's another soldier, and 
he went through dark times and he, uh, he always wanted to be an artist. And so we helped him ha uh, with his first uh, uh, photo exhibit. And now he's become a professional photographer. He's going off to the Himalayas. He's going to be working with a school, a, uh, a, a disability school. He's bringing all these wheelchairs over to the school. He's going to go climb a mountain. Uh, he's going to be donating his, his beautiful uh, uh, photography uh, to the school. And it's like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> like these people are doing great things that maybe they wouldn't have done otherwise. So yeah, for sure. It's uh there's pinching yourself moments. <laughs> but now do you have a favorite platform to tell stories? Is it writing? Is it podcast? Is it stage? Is it, like, do you have a favorite way? Yeah, I think all of those, I mean, are great. You know, I think that the, you know, getting up on a stage and speaking to teams of people who are trying to do big things, grow things, make the changes that are necessary for them to grow. Uh, I think that's a really powerful thing. That's really sustained a lot of our work. Um, you know, it's the way I make connections to companies to become potential sponsors of no barriers. And, um, that's been a great equation for us. Um, and, um, yeah, I think books are, you know, another great venue, but you know, if you write a book to, you know, just hoping that it's going to go viral, you know, and that it's going to sell a million copies and then in the world's going to sort of praise you and, you know, uh, sing your praises, then that, that's probably, you probably shouldn't write a book because that's going to be a huge letdown. You know, when you write a book, you know, uh, the people who need it will find it. And you just have to sort of trust that, that, that those people are craving um, the theme, the, you know, the value that you, that you're conveying in that book and they're going to find it and they're going to use it to go to places in their life. And you also have to write a book for, you know, because you have a story to tell that's inside of you and you want to get it out there. Maybe just even for your own kids, for your own grandkids, you know, that's enough in itself. And so, you know, to think that your book's going to be like this huge bestseller all the time, you know, don't even start because you're going to most likely be let down. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like the, that book becomes kind of a, a business card, as it were, right? You know, you, you write the book to get the word out, but then you go and do all the other hard yeah. work. So, And it's also incredibly important to write a book to um, solidify and organize your own thoughts because... You can talk like even on a podcast and you can sort of think quickly and kind of come up with an answer. But then when you write it down on paper or like on a computer, you go, Oh my God, that's BS. That thing I've been saying is BS. It's not really necessarily as true as it could be. Uh, so, so writing is this incredibly powerful process of, of making sure that you're getting to as close to the, you know, your truth as, as, as possible. And so uh, that's what I would definitely advise people who are writing to do. You know, you might get done with something and be like, it sounds pretty good. Well, no, sounds pretty good is not a test of a good, you know, book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gotta be sort of quote unquote true to your experience. Even if you were a total a-hole, even if you let your friends down, even if you didn't do the right thing, um, you know, that, that's where the power is. So this has been great, Eric. This has been awesome. Uh, if you could tell one last story and that was the last story you could tell, what would that look like for you? What would it be about? Hmm. Well, maybe I tell a no barrier story of this guy his name's Cole Rogers. Um, Cole was born with a pretty rare, or extremely rare disease. He can't really move too well. And um, he got the courage to come on a no barriers program with us. And we were going to climb a mountain and we looked for the right technology. We found this really great organization. They make this, this, this vehicle. It's called an action track chair. And it's like a tank. It's literally got tank rollers and it just plows its way up mountains. It's an electric motor. And um, so we got him on this action tracker. He was able to kind of steer his way up the mountain. We were all pushing and pulling and 
trying to get him through the steep spots. And then um, maybe a couple hundred yards from the top of the mountain, the action track chair died. You know, the motor gave out. Uh, and that happens with technology. So we're like, okay, what are we going to do? And one of the guys, strong guys on the team said, I'll just carry you to the top. And this kid said, uh, no, I don't want to be carried to the top. He goes, I'm going to, let me crawl. Let me, I can do this on my own. So we're like, cool. So he gets out of his action track chair and he can, you know, he can't move that well. He can just kind of move his arms a little bit and he kind of like wriggled and dragged his way to the summit. It probably took him an hour and we all kind of just walked along beside him and, you know, he left a trail of blood and some skin on that tundra, but he, he got to the top. He pulled himself to the very top rock of the summit and Everyone was crying. Everyone was cheering. And I thought, you know, that's what America, that's what the world needs to see. That's the kind of story that will, you know, give us sort of the, the energy to move forward in, in amazing ways. Um, we just need more of that. I mean, everyone needs more of that in their lives. That's a beautiful last story about Cole. That's, I can, I can feel it. I can hear the passion. I can, I can almost feel yeah. <clears throat> being there. So thank you I cry when that. I tell that story because yeah. this kid Cole has now gone on to start this organization. He teaches self-defense to other people with disabilities because he says that, you know, people with disabilities are like victims to crime and things like that because they can't really defend themselves as well. So he teaches uh, self-defense classes and uh, he's going on to do amazing things with his organization. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, No Barriers was a bit of a kickstart for him. Sounds like it. Wow, Eric, I could go on for, for days with you on this, um, but, I, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your time today. Where can people, uh, ease, the most easiest, find you? <laughs> uh, my website, touchthetop.com, uh, is a pretty good resource list. Tons of videos and mm. fun stuff. Um, also, they can check out No Barriers, nobarriersusa.org, and uh, learn about our work. Like if you have a, a veteran that you know or a, a, any, any kid, any teenager, any kid, any human being who struggles with um, something physical or emotional, uh, No Barriers is a great forum. It's a great community to join, uh, to, to, as I said, lean in and get stronger together. We have ongoing programs all around the country. And uh, you can learn more about us. Cool. We'll put those in the show notes for you. I appreciate your time today, Eric. It's been a pleasure yeah. getting to know you, man. My pleasure. Nice to talk to you. So thank you so much, Eric Wyanmayer. Be sure to visit him online. You can find those links in our show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it all over social media, email lists, text. Just tell somebody on the plane, wherever you want to talk about this. I would really appreciate it. And, uh, and certainly consider leaving us a review too, if you like that on, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, a big thank you to our partners here at the Storytellers Network, Casterly and Podcast Pilot. Thanks for making the world of podcasts a better place. Jamie J, Sarah Parrish, and the rest of the team over there. Terrific people, and you'll be better off knowing them. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to tell. Cheers.